come back. They can put Barramundi and Hazelwood Pondage, but I can't get internet on the morning speech. <laughs> That's very, very sad. Uh, I'm sorry, I've lost internet. We've got a bit of a storm brewing outside here, rain, thunder, everything else. But I'm physically back and I do apologize to everyone we cut off before, but the internet just went gone. So the question that I was answering, I'll just, I'll just, I'll fluff for a minute just to let people get back online. But basically, Hazelwood Pondage, there's barren money in there. I was lucky enough to catch them yesterday. I'm gonna answer every question you got. There's been a bit of negativity, but that's fair. Every time something's a bit outside the square, there's a little bit of negativity. Imagine if they said in 69, we can't fly to the moon. Imagine what some people said. So, at the end of the day, the biggest question people are asking, and we were lucky enough to go in there yesterday, and I think we caught 15 to 20 barra trolling, casting, and it was tough because I've never fished it before. No one's really fished it, so we had to suss it out. The big question everyone is asking, and I might repeat this later if people continue to ask, is what is gonna happen to all these barramundi? Now the first thing you gotta remember, these barramundi are fish that were gonna to go to a restaurant to be eaten. They literally come to Victoria as, as little fish this big, they're grown to this size, and they go to a restaurant to be eaten. So worst case scenario, if the fish didn't make it, they've still had a pretty good 12 months eating tilapia. Chad Soper says, could they adopt this in South Australia? Chad, um, Chad is on our Facebook page all the time. Good to see you, mate. Good to talk to you. I see your posts. The only way you can adopt this in South Australia is literally find a warm water solution. And if you look towards America, there are some potential things for the future with solar power heating lakes. And South Australia, sadly, is a long way behind, not just the half an hour in time difference, because you don't have a recreational fishing license. It's very hard to find the funds. But anywhere you have a will, there is a way, Chad. And I've got to say, this, this barren money in Hayeswood goes back a long way. In fact, we're talking probably 20, 30 years I remember 25, 30 years ago sitting at Tackle World Cram and having a few drinks after work saying, imagine if we could put Barra Mundy in Hayeswood and people laughed. At the same time, they were saying, you can't catch Brim and Lewis, you're gonna laugh. I'm just checking my computer here. And literally the timeline, this is how it goes for people who are interested around Australia and even the world, how this happened. I mean, Victoria, if you don't know, is the southern state, in the southern states of Australia. We've got cold water. I mean, today we've got about 12 degrees, yesterday might have been 30. But we have a lake that is actually heated by the Hayeswood Power Station. That station's been running a long time. I think it started in about 1965. So in 2006, myself and a friend of mine, David Kramer, we went to Morwell. Now it's a long way from Cranham, I'll give you the tip. And we did a presentation to the Morwell Council, Council saying that we could put barren money in the lake. And people said, is this serious? That was 2006. And I'm actually reading these notes, don't wanna get it wrong. Then the Future Fish Foundation applied to the state government for the possibility of putting barramundi in. This time I went through, we, we raised 50 grand from memory, did all the scientific research. In 2007, we actually asked for permission from the power station because they own the water. Then, permission was denied because we had this thing called the carbon tax come in. It put a bit of dent in things. But eventually, Tony Abbott repealed the carbon tax in 2014. And I'm not talking politics, just telling you how it is. Then, the power station was threatened to shut down in 2014. Things went pear-shaped again, but eventually, Daniel Andrews, who was the Victorian, well, Premier-elect at the time, was the opposition leader, he said for his announcement for the big state election, if he gets in, he's going to make Barra Money in Hazelwood work. Election promise, bang, it happened. And that's pretty much how we got to where we are today. So basically, we have, I think it's 6,738 fish in the pondage at present, and those fish are growing at a rapid rate. And the massive question, people are saying, when the power station shuts in March, what is going to physically happen to these barramundi? Now, everybody believes, and this is big news, nobody knows about this. I spoke to a few people today and I'm just checking my computers, I wanna get this right. Nobody actually believes that the power station can continue to supply hot water when it closes down, which is fair. And I've lost the page, now here it is, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you what is going on. There's lots and lots of questions. There's lots of questions, <laughs> I'll take Maybe the... some of them will be answered Hopefully like, I... by what you say now, and then I'll. Then maybe some people are gonna to have to repost Please them. repost your questions, this is important. I'm gonna read this, I wanna get it wrong. So, the Hazelwood Power Station is run by coal. It pumps hot water into the lake, the hot water is what keeps the barrel under your life. I think it goes in at 52, 54 degrees. They dig the coal from about a K down the road, there's two massive open mine coal plants. And this is the beautiful thing about all this. There are two sources of water that feed Hazelwood Pondage. One is the power station, the other is an underground artesian water source that is pumped from beneath the coal mine to stop the coal mine filling with water. So they didn't pump the water out, the coal mine would fill and they physically couldn't get to the coal. The artesian water is naturally 52 degrees Celsius and is pumped into Hazelwood Pondage at 600 litres per minute. So 600 litres of 52 degree water are pumped into the pondage every minute. The water needs to be pumped into the pondage whilst that mine is rehabilitated 
and this is an ongoing process that could go on for up for a decade beyond. So we've got a possibility that for the next two years, five years, 10 years, 52 degree water at 600 litres a minute, we pump to Hazelwood, that will keep the barramundi alive. And this happened last night. Daniel Andrews, the Premier, he is sitting at a thing called a caucus meeting. I don't even know what that means, but I think it's when all the politicians get together. We text him photos of our Baron Mundy from yesterday. He stopped his speech, held his phone up and said, no matter what happens, we need to keep Baron Mundy in Hazel Pondage because he feels bad because of what's happening down there. A lot of people are going to lose their jobs and I feel bad for all the people at Power Station. I feel bad for more while I was filming there yesterday. They want a good news story for this part of the world and catching Big Baron Mundy in Victoria is that good news story. So they will do everything in their power to keep this happening. Have you got any questions for me, Christy? <laughs> Um, John Paul thinks you're a cockhead, so maybe he should get off. John! <laughs> John! You're obviously a very good judge of character, mate. I really appreciate it. And look, it's an interesting thing. You can think what you like and I don't care. Sometimes people actually do things just because they want to make a difference. Oh, David said it's 600 litres per second, not per minute. You're right, David. Um, <laughs> if I could read, David, thank you. That must be my good friend, David Kramer. Um, yeah. It actually says here, 600 litres a second. So do the math. That's about 30... 6,000 litres a minute. Um, okay, so there's lots of confusion surrounding the ballot. Yep. Um, you have to ha be on okay. the ballot land-based. So, but... No, so there's two, <laughs> there's two types of fishing. And just to get this straight, fishing has not changed at Hazelwood for over 40 years. There's no new rules. This has not changed a thing. It is owned by the power station. I think it's called... I'm going to double check this. But anyway, the power station owns the water and no rules have changed. So if you want a land-based fish for Barramundi as of tomorrow, it opens tomorrow at I think 9 or 10 o'clock, but correct me if I'm wrong, you can go land-based fishing in all the land-based zones, not a problem. But 25 boats a day are going to be allowed in the lake. So if 25 boats go, that must be from the ballot because we don't want chaos. And everybody used to, needs to use this waterway. I believe 13,000 people have already entered the ballot. That's how big this is. Now, as far as I know, you go to vic.gov.au forward slash barra, get in the ballot. And some friends of mine, literally, are fishing tomorrow, the next few days, just absolute luck. The ballot's already finished at the end of December, but you still have the chance to enter the ballot for January, February, March. But at the end of the day, forget what I say, just go to vic.gov.au forward slash barra and take the opportunity to get involved in this ballot. Now, we've got a ballot system at the moment because obviously... 13,000 people want to fish Hazelwood tomorrow. It's huge. We can't all get to the Northern Territory, and I experienced it the other day. 30 degrees, glass calm, a barra a cast at one stage. We've got it all on film, and I believe it is going to air next Sunday on iFish with Tackle Water 1. Wait. Sunday week. Sunday week. Next Sunday week. We're not, we're not that good. That'll be my... Well, hang on. What's, what, oh, yeah, next, not yet. Not next Sunday. The next Sunday after this one. My enders were working full-time this morning putting this together because we want to show the world how good Victoria is. So... Joel Bacon has a good question. Yes, Joel. He said the photos from yesterday tend to look like you're fishing in the southeastern end. Yep. Are there hookups in the other end yes. of the pondage? So I'll take a step back. So we got there yesterday. I left my house on the Mauritian Peninsula at 6 a.m. And it took me exactly two hours through some peak hour traffic to get to Hazelwood. And we filmed the main street. So the lake is about 480 hectares. I'm not a good mathematician, but I think that is about... 2,000 acres, give or take. It's not big, but it's big. So I got on the lake. I've never fished it before I've water skied. Where do you start? Like, seriously, where do you catch a barramundi in Victoria? We ran around, like we were kids in a lolly shop, and mum had said, you've got 10 minutes to grab as much as you can. We went left, right, up, down, but we had no idea. We literally did not have any clue. So you start to disbelieve. You're seeing your sounder absolutely lighten up, and you think, thinking, hey, barramundi. And I can tell you now, I sounded barramundi every single square metre of that lake I stopped, I had massive arches. Okay, maybe we should just answer some questions super quick, because I'll, like, okay. just in dot point, Hit and then on. go to the, so is it catch and release? Okay, so I'd like to think it's catch and release. I would not eat a barren money out of Hazelwood Pondage, <laughs> only because, not because... <laughs> That's of, another question. Is it like, is it like the Homer Simpson? Yes, so <laughs> someone asked if you might grow an extra appendage. Um, I don't believe so. They've actually done tests on the fish, and it's safe to eat three times a week. So you can take, so each person who fishes is legally able to take one fish per day, per man, per woman. You can take, but any, don't. Any size limit? No size limit whatsoever because they're, it's a put and take fishery. Put them in, take them out. Okay. Um, lures, everyone's. Okay. Oh, no, sorry. That you never really got to so are they going to die when the power plant closes? So, no. They never finish that. Well, okay, so technically, 
we're hoping they're not going to because if they're pumping in 600 litres of 52 degree water every second, Barrow Muddy need a heat range of 20 to 28 degrees to survive. So in theory, these fish can survive assuming we can get this artesian water into the lake and the Andrews government at present is doing all they can to make it happen and we want to create jobs for the area. I mean, I know lakes in America are solar powered to keep the water warm and I reckon 5,000 to 10,000 Victorians would pay 100 bucks a year to become a Barramundi Hazelwood member and we'd have all the money we wanted to make this one of the biggest things ever. Okay. So the barrel aren't just going to go and die. That's the barrel aren't going to... And you know what? Look, they're not going to die. But you know, if they did, they've got two yeah. choices. Imagine, imagine this. As of yesterday, they scoop them out in a net, they put them in ice water, and they send them to a restaurant. Option two, get to go to Hazelwood, sunbake in 40 degree water, eat tilapia, and then die. I know what option I'd take. Now, people are worried there'll be none left by January if you can take them out. But there's a blooming lot of barrel. We have <laughs> trucks. Okay, so I think... David, I spoke to David before I came on here. I think there's been 7,000 released so far. They are growing at a rate of knots. We actually caught tag barramundi yesterday, had fisheries with us, and in 12 weeks, they have quadrupled their size, which is mind-blowing. And we're at the point, it's a put-and-take fishery. As many as you can take out, we're just going to keep pumping back. And we've literally got semi-trailers full of barra, ready to come and pump more in the lake so every single person can come and catch them. Okay, so if you have a kayak, yep. does that apply to the boat rules? I believe it does, because there was a kayaker down there yesterday, right. and Fisheries had a word with him, because I think he's trying to slip off the roof. Okay. So, I believe it's it's land-based, and or on water. Okay, so, so if you're on the water, you must have the barrel ballot. You must be in the ballot. But you can go anytime land-based. Absolutely. Okay, so lures is probably the next thing. Okay, scene. so I just ran to the boat, and it was raining. I haven't even had a chance to pack the boat up yesterday. So these are some lures. Then we smash the barrel. And please, Christy, make me go back to the question of how to catch these things. So Yeah, and we've got a list of questions. Well, I have got a list of well. I have. So imagine going to a place for the first time ever and knowing nothing. That was where we were yesterday. And I just had this gut feeling. You look at that, that box there. This is one of five boxes. Just to give you an idea, because I, uh, I wasn't quite sure. So I went to the fishing table room, and I just kept grabbing lures. This mate, means I can buy more shoes. I'm thinking not. So I went to a tackle room, literally just got... Barrel lures, big, small, because when I go to the daily, I know which ones to use. When I go to Shady Camp, I know, but I had no idea. And what I did, I just thought, I'm going to do something here and take some stuff. Oh, and I can answer Cody. Cody wants to know um, what if there's no natural food source. Cody, there is so many to up here in that place. There is. So the they reason, are not going hungry. <laughs> so the reason we put these fish in is because there's tilapia, which are a, a type of African cichlid. They are there in their millions of tons, I reckon. They were released years ago by someone, and we electrofish yesterday, and we were just catching tilapia by the bucket load. These are the biggest, fattest barramundi on history. And Travis Dowling, at least the state recently, to say it looks like they are growing at growth rates that are unprecedented worldwide. We're talking, I reckon, by June next year, we'll have metre barramundi in Hazelwood. And so fat. what was the biggest you saw yesterday? People want to know that. So the too. biggest fish we physically saw yesterday was 70 centimetres. And that fish was over six kilos, which for a 70 centimetre barra, that is massive. I reckon the first metre barra to come out of Hazelwood, at a guess, will possibly weigh 35 pounds. They're going to be the biggest, fattest barra money possibly ever, ever anywhere in the world. They're like SpongeBob SquarePants. They're, they're this deep and this big. They're just unbelievable. Now, the average fish from yesterday was 45 to 54 centimetres, but the fattest and biggest I've ever caught for that weight. So... Lures. These are like some of the lures. Now, what I did, I went and did some research on tilapia, what tilapia look like. And that's pretty much what a tilapia looks like. They're big, they're round, they're fat, and um, they've got some stripes and dots, whatever. But I also had this gut feeling based on what people have been telling me and, and, and the color of the water, it's very, very dirty. And I just felt like orange was gonna do the job. And that's a Rapala x wrap in orange. That lure there is called black bass to probably 40 pounds. And that smashed the barramundi yesterday. The other one that smashed him, this guy here. Now, that obviously gold for barramundi. Oh, there's a spare BMC treble. Sorry about that. This is a, a, a Rashi lure. It's got a very thin bib, so it cuts down super deep, super quick. And that accounted for more barramundi yesterday than any other lure. I love gold. And see how it's got that shorter, rounder, fatter profile? Again, very tilapia-ish. And this is another one. Obviously, I'm storing my lures very well that tail dancer. Now, not that particular one. I lost the lure that caught probably more fish than that one, actually. But tail dancers fish very well, too. 
This thing here, again, Arashi, I think this might be called the, uh, well, it's just a 10. Uh, so it's, it hasn't actually got a color, it looks very crawny to me. That fished well. Um, Thunders, where are you here, this guy here? The Thunder Barra, that fished well too. But there's one, that fished well there, bit of orange, bit of gold, bit of black. Um, and the other thing too, I had a chance to throw some poppers at one stage, little skitter pops. So cool, absolute LB tangle there, I apologize. But we threw skitter pops around some lilies and the barramundi, OMG, so exciting. So, the key to catching them. If I was going there, and this is what people want to know, forget all the other stuff. It's a new waterway, you've got to find the fish. I, I put the sounder on, massive arches everywhere, and they were barramundi. I would troll, the first troll until you find fish. So after running here, there, everywhere, no confidence at all. We put some lures out in an area we thought there might be some fish. We trolled 20 meters, bang, went back, double hook up, we're on the fish. Once we found the fish on the troll, then we started to cast. I think it's the most effective way of catching because the fish will sit in pockets and they'll physically sit in a big bunch because they want to be around their mates. Once you, once you find them, start casting. Now, water temps is big. Technically, barramundi won't feed under, well, under 20, over 28 degrees. At one stage yesterday, we had a surface water temp of 40 degrees. We had a barramundi in the life tank and we ran up the river and it actually passed away because I reckon it just got too hot for it. We tried to revive it and we gave it to fisheries to do some research with. So technically 30 is about to stop. But what we found, we didn't want to fish 38 degrees when we got there, barram so we went everywhere looking for cold water. We found 28, couldn't find a barram. Then after catching fish in 36, 37 degrees, my producer hopped in the water, did some underwater filming and some diving. Here we can six foot below the surface, the water temperature dropped five to 10 degrees. So that's what we learned yesterday. So look at your sound, look at your temp, but don't necessarily think that's what the barra sitting in. And that's why we find lures that will dive to 10 feet, work extremely well, because they're getting below that super hot water and they're getting to where the fish are actually gonna be able to feed. What depth is hazelwood? Okay, so average depth is difficult, but we caught all our barra in around four meters of water to five meters of water. The deepest water I saw yesterday was eight meters, but I'd say an average depth is probably only four meters, but Average, that's the whole thing. Generally, you're gonna be fishing in four to six meters of water, and I hit mud at one stage at, at high speeds, so and be very careful where you go. Because I wanna see, Adam Cole wants to see the gear that you're using, so do heaps of other people. Okay, so. It's going too fast, sorry, Aaron. I apologize. Uh, so, there's two types of gear to use for these barramundi. One is your bait cast outfit, which I used yesterday, but the other is spins. So when it comes to a bait caster, don't have to spend big bucks to get a decent reel. This is Shimano Sitica. I love these reels. They're not the most expensive, but I love them. Um, I use 45 pound Fins 40G braid. The reason for that, it is about as thick as a normal 15 pound, but you're gonna stop big barra really, really quick. And uh, 40G is the best braid in the business. This is a Loomis IMX rod. This is up there, this is a beautiful stick, but I just like the idea of using good gear, cork grips. But I also fished yesterday with Raiders and I fished with Loomis GL2s. And this is the key to catching barra, 60 pound leader. I use 60 pound instinct monofilament. And this will be a dodgy knot because this was tied late in the day. So that is literally called a slim beauty, that knot there. Learn to tie a slim beauty. I can tie a slim beauty in about 35 seconds, I reckon. And I've stopped world record fish on it. It's an absolute gun. And run about six foot a litre and then tie your lure to the end. Your other knot is an FG. So when I go fishing in the morning, every knot is an FG. And as I smash through the day and bust off whatever, they tend to be slim beauty. So this guy here, this is a Barramundi spin stick. And you can physically use spin gear for barramundi, particularly your first effort. Again, excuse the LB tangle there, that's my leader. And on there, what have we got there? I can't even see my knot there. But again, that one's 20 pound fins. The rod is just beautiful. It's one of the new Shimano's, if I can pronounce it, I'll be happy. It's Makuru 732 Snapper. That's really a jigging rod, but it's great for casting lures a long distance. And uh, the Stratic Reel, I like the 5000s of a big power knob there. Um, I'm just trying to see my knot to see what we actually come up with. I'd say it's another slim beauty because it was late in the day, but that is a beautiful barramundi spin rod. What about a uni knot? Uh, uni knots are good, but I wouldn't tie a uni when I could tie a slim beauty. As far as I'm concerned, I'm, I'm, I've been wrong many times. There's two knots to tie to join braid to mono. People want to know this. One is the slim beauty because it's an absolute gun. And if you've got the time, you, you tie an FG because FGs are amazing. Um, okay, so plenty of people asking, are you allowed to use live bait? No. So you're only allowed to fish with artificial lures, and I don't know why they come up with this concept. So but no I, bait at all? No bait. Well, you can use bait, I believe, okay. but, but not live bait. 
but maybe just check the regulations on that, but I assume it's live bait. But seriously, barramundi fishing with bait, it ain't fun. It's not what barramundi, barramundi is about sport fishing, it's about casting lure, it's about feeling as it. So I fish for barramundi with bait up north, but literally sit there with a bait cast in the sun, get a tap, bang, you catch one, that's great. But trolling, casting, plastics, that's what barrow fishing is about. Um, Chris Montgomery said a loop knot to the... To the lure? To the lure. Okay, so that's a, that's a great question, Chris. And I'm just going to try and grab another lure here. Oh, I'm going to grab the whole box. So this little rapala here I used yesterday, you'll see it's got a solid ring on its nose. So I tie the lure with a uni knot directly to the ring because there's no benefit, sorry, the line. There's no benefit whatsoever in, because see that? The lure is still going to swim beautifully and it's not going to stop that action whatsoever. But when I get to this lure here, which has a split ring on a little knot there, which I wasn't quite comfortable about the way that might swim, I tied a loop knot and just tie a standard loop knot. There's plenty of great ones in the book. Um, anyone that you're comfortable with and that loop knot there literally will hold meter fish, meter plus fish every time. So if you can tie an FG and you can tie a loop knot and a uni, you can go and catch big barramundi anywhere in the world. Um, did you get any bycatch yesterday? Well, we did. So we only caught barramundi on rod and reel, but I was lucky enough that fisheries were there actually doing some electro fishing. And I jumped on their boat because I wanted to see what was down there. And what blew me away yesterday, and this has never happened in the history of I fish anywhere, we caught more barramundi than the electro fish boat did. So imagine that, they're putting, I think it's 700 volts into the water. I think for the day, and please don't quite, I think they might've caught less than 10 barramundi. We caught 15 to 20, which I reckon is a fair effort seeing where we're using lures. I, I would've put a million dollars, that wouldn't happen. But they also caught a lot of tilapia. And I've got some beautiful photos of all these tropical fish that are living in these waters that the barramundi are feeding on. And uh, there's also some nice eels, carp and other stuff there. And a barramundi can eat a fish two thirds of its own size. So you get a, 10 kilo barra, it can eat a 6.6 .6 kilo barra mundi. So they're literally going to clean everything up when they get big. Um, do you think kids will be able to catch barra lamb base there? I have no doubt that kids will be able to catch barra lamb base. Absolute no brainer. Just try and get some lures that have some body to them so you can cast them a long way. The other thing we found yesterday, quite often with barra mundi, you've got to really twitch the lure. So getting back to this guy here, you get a barra lure out and you really, you twitch and you hold. You twitch and you hold. One of the, one of the techniques that got most fish yesterday was cast it. Cast the lure to the surface, drag it down really quick to get it to the depth, and then a slow roll. So this lure is literally wind the handle really slow and just let it sit right there in front of the barramundi's face. And I reckon nine out of 10 fish were not hooked in the mouth. They walked across the head here. They're literally coming up and attacking the lure. And my theory was these aren't wild fish. Just give them some more time to eat the lure and they sure ate the lure. I mean, that lure was pretty much brand new yesterday and it's very well scuffed up. Um, there's lots of people that I think have joined recently yep. asking questions that have been answered. So we will post this uh, this feed, this feed yep. after this, and everyone can rewatch it. Um, Is well, the most popular <laughs> question still? Danny Thompson, have you ever punched a kangaroo? Uh, Danny, <laughs> Danny, I would, but I'm not strong enough, to, and I'm a bit scared of kangaroos. Um, so we've done the lures. Everyone wants you to do a shoey, which uh, is not going to happen because I can't leave the room to go and get one. And, and, uh, and I've only got my moccasins because I've just been to Morwell for the day. Uh, no, uh, just one more thing, Chrissy. That is a weedless soft plastic. I reckon that is potentially one of the greatest barramundi lures of all time. It's a squidgy mongrel, and that's a VMC worm hook. And what you do, you literally rig this like this. So you just get your worm hook and you thread it through the front of the bait, and then you push it up through the guts there. And I find the hole, which is there, so it's a little purpose built hole. And that just feeds its way up through there. I always want to do this live, Paul. Go, go, Paulie. Okay, that goes up through there like that, right? I rig that. I tie a big loop knot through there. I put a ball sinker in the front of the loop. The ball sinker takes it down. On the way down, this swims and a very slow wind, like slow. And this goes dum, 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 dum. It goes through the weed, the snags, the barra crunch it, and they get hooked. That is deadly. Gary Gant says, do they bite like the barra up north? You know, that's a fantastic question. And people ask me that on Facebook Other today. people did ask as well, but I just saw his. <laughs> 100% yesterday, 30 degrees, glass calm, putting sunscreen on, putting the buff over my head. I was hooking these barra. They were getting airborne. They were going ballistic. I thought I was in the Northern Territory. It was, I was waiting for a crocodile. I wanted to jump in the water because I was scared of a crocodile. These barra hit hard. They jump. They fight hard. What cod lures could be effective with the barra? Anthony Morton. Anthony, 
go and get some Storm Arashi. This is the big guy. I also took some of the smaller ones, which might be in my other box, but um, I took some of the smaller Storm that I can find. Where are we? Um, and they were effective. And they do a small one, which dies to 15 feet. Because the one thing I found with these Barra, uh, this was good too. Sorry, I get excited. A jointed Rapala. Barra oh, love. Cool. Barra love jointed lures. I should really organise my tackle, shouldn't I, Chrissy? When we finish, Chrissy, will you have a little? Kane Gary Turtle said, What tide is best to catch them? Love your work. Clever Kane. Well, I don't know if you know about this, Chrissy. <laughs> you do know, don't you? Yeah, I do know. <laughs> do I share the secret? I'll share the secret. So, you're going to think I'm crazy. <laughs> Christy already knows I'm crazy. So, having ever been in this fishery before and, and having no idea, and I'm happy to admit that I've got no idea, I did a bit of research. These fish come to Victoria this big. A barramundi is born 18 hours after the egg is laid and a barramundi can lay 40 million eggs. They've grown in a pond. They're put in a pond. But at the end of the day, they are still wild fish. They have the instincts of a wild fish. And I believe, and, and laugh me if you're wrong, I believe these fish still react to the environment and the tides. So yesterday, the best bite time was on the tide change. And I'm fishing a freshwater lake. So what I did with Christy, we Googled, we found the closest port, which was Port Allen and McLaughlin's. And yesterday the tide change was about 12.30. And in the morning I said to my crew, I reckon the best, the best bite from Barra today <coughs> Excuse, will be between 12 and 1. On the tide change, they laughed at me. And between 12 and 1, we had the hottest barra Monday bite of the entire day and probably had 30 to 40 hits in an hour. Camera on the tripod, rolled it up, and I believe it was because of the tide, whether you want to laugh or not. Taj Rodwell, can they breed in the pondage? No, so barra Monday needs salt water to breed. So no impoundment barra can breed. Their sole purpose is to eat food, get fat, and fight hard. So that's why pondage fish are amazing. And the great thing too, if they get out of the lake, they're not an invasive species because they'll die straight away. So they're the perfect fish to have in that environment. Um, yes, to everyone asking, Tackleball Mornington and Tackleball Cramman do now have plenty. Well, they always did, but now we've got even more barrel lures. So we've, we've always <laughs> stocked lots of barrel lures because I've barrel fished for many, many years. Um, I, think, I remember our first barrel money, Christy, on the South Alligator River many, many moons ago. Mm -hmm. um, we showering might. with the frogs. Yeah, showering with the frogs. <laughs> we might have just been boyfriend and girlfriend back then. Um, it was incredible, and we've always stocked it because we love it. But what we've done, we physically got the barrel lures that these fish are eating. And even today, I made phone calls, believe it or not. One phone call today was to Finland because I smashed some of these fish on a lure that when I was at the Rapala factory 18 months ago, they gave me that lure was dynamite. I found it in my drawer. And I actually spoke to the team at Rapala Finland today and they are going through the factory trying to find me a box or two or three or maybe ten of this particular lure because it smashed everything and hopefully they'll be air freighting them tomorrow. So we're going to have the stuff that's going to catch these fish. Okay, uh, can you fish at night? That's a very good question. Land based. Okay, yes I believe you can. The best thing about fishing is night. at night is fisheries can't see it. <laughs> I'm joking. Now, fisheries... <laughs> Fisheries are actually on the waterway, so it's it's the power station that's been having all these rules over the years. So I think you can, but don't quote me. Probably best to talk to someone else, but yep. Okay, Patrick Manthe, the water temp was 36.6 where Paul was catching them. Cheryl Cook eating, that's up to you. Everyone's asking that. That's so, They've said that it's okay, but... But I would never... Forget Hazelwood. I've fished Proserpine, Awonga, Mondrian, all the best barra dams in the world. I would never, ever, ever eat a barra made out of a dam. They're going to taste like crap. Yes. It's not about that. Yes, as Tucker World Sale, Tucker World Mall, they have heaps of lures as well, I'm uh, sure. I believe Anthony from Tucker World Sale has actually picked up a spot in the ballot this week, and he'll be watching this, I almost guarantee it, and he's keen to go smash some barrow too. Um, so I think the best thing to do is, because yep. um, I'm hungry, I haven't had dinner. <laughs> it's all about um, you. <laughs> is go a little recap so okay. the power station if it well it, it is most likely going to close but we have the second resource for heating the water so if the power station closes there's a chance they're currently pumping 600 liters of water per second into the lake it's at 52 degrees celsius they have to pump this water it's artesian water from below the coal mine if they don't the coal mine will fill with water that's going to have to happen for a long time i'm talking a long long time whilst they rehabilitate the coal mine so there's a big chance that we're going to have hot water in Hazelwood for a long time, which means that barramundi can still survive even if the power station closes. If you fish 
Fishing from a boat, you must have a spot in the ballot. You must have a spot in the ballot fishing from a boat. And, and do that by getting on to vic.gov forward slash barra. Remember, but I'll read it. Or you can go to um, the Victorian Fisheries page on Facebook and I think there's a link on there as well. There, there is a link on there as well. Let me just double check. It's vic.gov.au forward slash barra. Now, if you want to fish land-based pretty much day or night, you, you can go there anytime you like. Anytime you like and just make sure you're fishing the fishing zones and those fishing zones have not changed in 40 years. Use 60 pound litre for barra because you probably, uh, my fingers, look at this, slice there. That's a barramundi. Oh, I'll get you a cup of concrete. Yeah, thanks, hun. That's a barramundi. <laughs> That's a barramundi. Barramundi has caused more scars on my body than any other fish, but I don't care. Cody Shrouder, no, it does not cost money to land based fish there. I don't believe it costs money to fish there full stop, does it? I, no, it's, it's not. As long as you have the barra ballot for your boat. Yep, you're right. Um, you cannot use live bait there. No, you cannot use live bait. Um, and I just want to. I just want to thank a few people before we keep, if there's any other questions, because a lot yeah, of people have made, people, a lot of people yeah. made this happen. I think it's important. It's easy. It's easy to go on the ballot and go and catch a barrow money in Victoria. But lots of people have spent tens, twenties, hundreds, thousands of hours making this happen. Mm -hmm. So Future Fish Foundation, they raised 50 grand Future and Future. made this happen. They spent the money. So thanks to Future Fish Foundation. Dr. Paul Hardy Smith, veterinary scientist, he went down there, sampled the water, sampled, just, did hundreds of hours again before we even knew. The La Trobe City Council, we went and saw them a decade ago with this crazy idea. It was stupid at the time. They backed us, they've supported. It's pronounced Engai, I believe. They're the owners of the power station. And even though they're being shut down potentially, they're still supporting this incredible work. So thank you. And, and my thoughts go out to all the people who work down there because I was there yesterday, it actually made me feel sick for the people who are gonna lose their jobs. And that whole area is built around that, that power station provides Victoria with 25% of its power every year and 5% of Australia's power. So you look at that and you just do feel sorry. Um, no politics, but Daniel Andrews, a politician, well, he might've made a mistake here or there, but he promised Barramundi, so I'm gonna forgive him for some of them. He said he'd do it and he has. Yala Pulford, Minister for Fisheries, put it on the line, said they're gonna do it, and I appreciate that so much from a fishing perspective. Travis Dowling, he's the Executive Director of Fisheries Victoria. Trav, you're a great bloke, and I'm just so thankful because what you do for people is amazing. Anthony Forster actually had a cast of him yesterday. He's managed most of this project, doing a great job. And uh, Dr. Brett Ingram, scientist from Fisher Victoria and all the people too from the Arthur Ryler Institute. We're talking not tens, twenties, hundreds of people have given you the chance to go barramundi fishing in Victoria. And I've heard of people coming from New South Wales, Tassie, South Australia, to go barra fishing in our great state and I'm pretty pumped. Um, so kayaks do count as a boat. I'm going to people, say that. I'm going to yeah, say that. Yeah, a do. lot of people are uh, confirming that is yep. the case. Um, but obviously jump on board and check that out. The best colour lures were something that resembled a tilapia. <laughs> a tilapia, and so tilapia range in colour, but uh, oranges, golds, reds, stripes, spots. We pretty much know now that's what the fish love okay. to eat. Um, Two questions here. I'm trying to read. Sorry, they are so quick. Uh, will the barra ballot go as long as the barra in there? That's a great question. Yeah. So, so our long-term hope is once once all uh, the fuss and the show and... I think we're just getting a fax. <laughs> We've gone back to 1975 because you were getting a fax. <laughs> it's incredible. Stop it, I'm making the camera. So, let's go. Now, I, I, that's just, I can't believe. I thought I was just going to talk, but I got a fax. Um, so, in theory, once the shine comes off, everyone's done their thing. We want to pump so many barrow money to this place that every person just go down and fish. And I would like to think that one day it'll be a lake where you wake up in the morning, it's a nice day, you take mum, dad, the kids, the dog, and you go to Hazelwood and catch a barrow. And if you catch all the barrow, we'll just keep pumping more in. That's the long-term goal. Okay, but you don't know if the ballot will actually... Well, hope, no, hopefully not. Hopefully it's going to become a lake that is just full of fish that people can go and catch. Was it Upton says, is there any structure in the lake? That's a good question. Was... Western Australian man, sorry you didn't win the apprentice comp, mate. If I had had my vote, I probably would have just gone good bloke. Um, was it there's very little structure. So there's a few rock walls. There's some snags around the island. The general depth around the island is around 80 centimetres. Uh, but I'm also thinking long term, if we make this a viable fishery, the power station closes, why would we put some structure in the lake? Get locals to find dead trees, have a working bee, give the fish a place to live a home. At the moment, the structure is all about the eddies and where the water moves all that water tent. 
Um, yes, this will be an Ifish episode, and that should be Sunday week, hopefully. Sunday week. I actually said Sunday. So not this Sunday, but next Sunday, 1HD around the country, 5.30pm, will be our fishing we did at Hazelwood Pondage yesterday, which is another great thing too. My team at Ifish, I've got to thank them all. Tom, Dan Wilson, your absolute champion, Noni, Bobby. They literally are turning this around in about nine, well, take out the weekend. They're turning around an episode of iFish in six days. And uh, they've put a lot of stuff aside. They're working late nights to make sure we can get it to you as soon as we physically can. And I'm pretty proud of their work. How big were the barrow when they put them in? So I've got that, but I think there was a, a heap went in at five centimetres, a truckload went in at 10, some went in at 30. And uh, they're basically all growing at phenomenal rates. I've got the exact figures here and I don't bore you with them. I'll see if I can quickly see it, but uh, basically, basically a tiny, some of them are this big, and uh, they are just smashing it up. And our hope is to eventually to put, oh, here we go. So just, here's the exact facts. September, 2015, 18, 30 centimeter fish went in and 120, 10 centimeter fish. These fish are now, the 30 centimeter fish now are 80 centimeters. So they've got, then in April, 2016, 1,005 centimeter fish, 510 centimetre fish and 130 centimetre fish went in. Those 30 centimetre fish are now 70 centimetres with a total stocking to date of 6,738 fish. Um, what's the average depth? I think we covered Average depth, depth, let's say four to eight metres. Would you have any big tips for anyone going land base there? Going land base, get lures that get down very quickly. You want, you want big bibs. You want to, most of the fish I sound of the big fish were sitting on the bottom in the cooler water because they can't handle the extreme 40 degree temps. So get lures that you can cast. Big draw when they hit the water, get them down and get them to almost work the bottom. And don't be scared to use a big lure, large profile. And of course, keep those oranges, golds, greens, those big bright colors because the lake is filthy. And the other lure too, the old Rattlin Wrap, seven centimeter. When you pull that vibe up, I'll do the sound. It goes and it lets the fish know you're there. Um, Brett said, are they mostly male or female? But I'm guessing because of the size, they'd be male? No, good question. Yeah, so <laughs> are they male know. or female? So <laughs> technically, as, Barram as Barramundi grows, look at a growth curve, the longer a Barramundi becomes, the higher the percentage it is that's going to be a female. But I believe they need salt water to change sex. So technically, at the moment, 95% of the Barramundi in Hazelwood would be males. Hmm. And even though they'll reach... A meter thirty, a meter forty, and one hundred pound. Eventually, I think they may still be male fish, but don't quote me because I'm not a fishing scientist, just a fisherman. Um, people asking the survival rate of the fish that are going in, but I think it's uh, pretty much okay, well survival rate at the moment. So that initially they put eighteen fish from memory in a swimming pool, and they pumped the water out of the lake into the pool and back for a period. Every one of those fish survived. Those fish were in the lake. And yesterday, let's say we caught twenty barramundi. Two of those barra had tags and the fish are tagged. So we're catching re-tag, well, we're catching fish that are, at the moment, survival rate seems to be 99%. These fish aren't just surviving, they are thriving. Okay, I'm really hungry now. <laughs> it's not all about you, Christy. So no more questions. Eight till eight, no, there's a million. Like, that was 43 minutes. <laughs> there's a million, but I, I do think the majority of them have been answered, so I'll repost this. And people can watch it and fast forward it if they want. And, and I'm pretty sure all your and if you if you've got any questions that we haven't answered, please let us know. And just remember, Will Roche, Will, Will you, you live way too far Will, away. Now, he wants to know how big the lake is. Well, the lake <laughs> is 480 hectares, about about 2,000 acres. And it's when I was there, it felt about two kilometres wide and about eight to ten kilometres long. And, it go, and Will, it's only. 5.43 in Exmouth, but I think you should be brushing your teeth and going to bed very soon. Uh, Will's a champion. Angle. Look, I just want to thank every single person that ended this project, and particularly David Kramer. A decade ago, Dave and I were just two blokes who went fishing and met each other, and he worked tirelessly to make this happen. Since then, we've become even better mates. He now runs my Kramer store. He has a stake in my Moynton store. He does all that sort of stuff, but at the end of the day, he spends ridiculous amounts of hours doing things for fishing. I mean, I think this weekend he's off to a cod forum. So David, when you caught that first barrel money and I nearly pushed you out of the boat because your rod took off before mine this week, I actually noticed behind your spotters he had a tear in his eye. And I think that's really, really cool when you feel that emotion of a barrel money that big bringing a grown man to his knees, it's a pretty special thing. And I just hope that you get the opportunity to get down there and catch a barrel money for yourself, particularly for the people that can't afford to fly into state. 
it really is the opportunity of a lifetime. So love your work, get into it. I need to feed this girl. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Cheers. <laughs>